I'm a big fan of Teddy Roosevelt um, because um, I'm actually family friends with the Roosevelt family. And I just admire the way that he fought for the little guy and then helped take a government that was heading the wrong direction and turn it to the right direction, really through a very, very strong moral compass. So I'm a huge Teddy Roosevelt fan. I think having a, an Asian American, Chinese American president would be great for the community. And I would love to empower and invigorate Chinese Americans around the country and then have a these Chinese American party at the White House. We call it the Gold House for one day and we just bring everyone in. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. I would love to do that. I've now been around the country for the last seven years with my organization, Venture for America. Uh, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Louisiana, and there are many, many parts of this country that are not doing well at all. And in those parts of the country, people are getting angrier, they're getting more xenophobic, and over time that will come and uh, be very, very bad for Asian Americans and Chinese Americans in this country. Particularly because China now is being regarded as this great rival to the United States. But if we come together right now, Asian Americans are 5.8% of the U.S. population. Now, that does not sound like a lot, but we have an historic opportunity because in this Democratic race coming up, there are going to be 20 to 25 national candidates. And so if there was an Asian American presidential candidate that got 4 or 5% of the vote, that would be enough to make me a tier one candidate in a very crowded field and would get me on the national debate stage next to Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Cory Booker. And how good would that feel to the Asian American community to have an Asian American presidential candidate on that stage next summer? The United States of America right now is going towards being majority minority in 2045. That's 28 years from now, 27 years from now. And there are very, very few examples in world history of a dominant ethnic group voluntarily sharing or giving up its dominance to other groups. That is not an historical norm. So what you'd expect to have happen over the next 27 years is rising racism, rising racial tensions, and rising economic strife, especially as we decimate the most common middle class jobs in this country, which we're in the midst of doing right now. I dug into the numbers, and there's a very, very clear explanation for why Donald Trump became president in 2016. If you look at the data in every voting district, there's a direct correlation between the adoption of industrial robots in a voting district and the movement towards Donald Trump over the last four or eight years. The reason why Americans seem so upset is that the labor force participation rate is now, to, now down to 62.9% which is the same levels as El Salvador and the Dominican Republic, right now, in year 10 of an expansion. Almost one in five prime working age American men has not worked in the last 12 months. And I, again, sensed this and saw this when I was traveling the Midwest of the South. You may ask, like, what the heck can we do to help the American people and the economy get through this set of transitions? So I've got a three-part plan. The first is, is called a freedom dividend. Raise your hand if you've heard of something called universal basic income. So universal basic income is something that many technologists have projected. They, they think, hey, if you start getting rid of lots of jobs, then we're gonna to need to find a new way to distribute value in society to enable people to, to prosper. So the freedom dividend would put a thousand dollar screen thing into the hands of every adult uh, between the age of 18 to 64, no questions asked. And that would be an incredible boon to millions of Americans because right now 57% of them cannot afford an unexpected $500 bill. What happens when you're in a mindset of scarcity like that, uh, and I have studies in my book, that your effective IQ goes down by 13 points if you have bills you can't pay. And for those of us in the room, it might not be economic scarcity, it might be time scarcity. So if it seems like Americans are getting dumber, more impulsive, nastier, more racist, more xenophobic, more misogynist, that is why. It's because scarcity is sweeping this country and we need to reverse it with a sense of abundance. The second big change is that we need to start measuring our economy differently because the truth is that GDP will not have any need for unemployed cashiers, truck drivers, call center workers. The, the market is not going to, to need many of their skills. And so what we need to do is we need to create new measurements that everyone can participate in. Things like childhood success, mental health, community engagement, 
infrastructure, environmental sustainability, arts and creativity, to create more goals that more Americans can participate in as we transition to an economy where machines and software do more and more of the work. And the third thing, um, how many of you have run a business? I feel like a lot of you. Like, I've run a business too. Keep your hand up if you hated dealing with healthcare for your employees. I hated it so much where you have to try and become an expert in healthcare plans and the rest of it. You have to navigate all of these issues. It makes it harder to start a business, harder to grow a business, harder to change jobs, harder to leave your job. It makes the entire labor market much less dynamic. So what we have to do is we have to get healthcare off the backs of American families and businesses in the US. The healthcare system right now, we spend twice as much as other countries to worse effect. And so we need to get healthcare off the backs of businesses and families. And that's something that I'm really excited to do to help streamline it and also make the cost lower and use technology to, to deliver better care. So those are the big three points of my plan. Number one, freedom dividend. Number two, new measurements for the economy so that people aren't trapped in this GDP thinking. And number three, universal health care to lower costs and ease access for more and more Americans. California used to be an afterthought in presidential contests because you guys are very late in the process and by the time it gets to you, it's already been decided. But you might have noticed that they actually moved California up to number five this year. I don't know, how many of you knew that? You got moved up to number five. You guys would because you're very politically active. Most of you didn't know that. Oh, this is exciting. So the order this year, in 2020, this cycle, is Iowa number one, New Hampshire number two, South Carolina number three, Nevada number four, and then California number five. California is actually going to be a hotbed. California is going to decide who's going to be the Democratic nominee. And so for the first time in, in the time I can remember, Asian Americans will be an incredibly important voting bloc. Because who Asian Americans in California support has a much, much higher chance of becoming the Democratic nominee. So this is an historic chance. Again, I guys hope you guys appreciate this. I'm like an Asian guy who likes numbers. I figured out the numbers, and this is the lever. The main reason I'm running for president is that I have been around the people that are supposed to run our country, and we are as smart, as good, as educated, as moral, and we love this country and our families just as much as anyone else, and there's no reason why one of us cannot be the president of the United States in 2021.